happy Monday, everyone. Hope you survived that you know, nasty big yellow thing in the sky. Just the horrible. Uh, so uh, this is the part of the term where I will probably say vaccinate about 15 times every lecture. So if I don't, remind me, and I will try and catch up with those extra ones here. Uh, <clears throat> so today, we were doing positive strands. Now we're doing negative strands. Um, this are, these are the other major class of single-stranded RNA viruses. And these are particularly important, interesting from a molecular point of view because negative strand is really kind of fascinating because it means the genome that comes inside the cell can't do anything by itself. It has to have some kind of virus protein before it can do anything at all. So that's the molecular aspect of things that's really interesting. The non-molecular aspect has to do with all of our friends, these nasty diseases of humans, um, many of which um, have really good vaccines against them, which is one of the reasons I'll be talking about vaccines. Unfortunately, not everyone is using them, and that's a major problem that we will also talk about uh, to some extent for the rest of today. Um, the big one is measles. Measles is a disease that is pretty widespread throughout the world, not so much in the U.S., but we've had a number of recent outbreaks because people haven't been Vaccinating, exactly. Same thing is true for mumps. Um, respiratory syncytial virus is actually a really new vaccine for this. We aren't going to talk too much about it. It causes huge amounts of death among kids in the developing world. Sendai virus is a really nice model system for studying some of these. Rabies is actually not a paramyxovirus. It's a rhabdovirus, but as we'll see, the only real difference between the two is the shape of the virion. Otherwise, molecularly, they're extremely similar to each other. And vesicular stomatitis virus is sort of the model for the rabies virus. A couple of key molecular concepts that we'll talk about after we talk about the boring disease stuff at the beginning uh, has to do with subgenomic RNAs. And so we talked a little bit about subgenomic RDAs when we talked about the coronaviruses. Those are all those nested ones. They're down towards the three prime end of the genome. Here it's a little bit different. The subgenomic RNAs are made by what's called start and stop messenger RNA production or transcription, where a little bit of RNA gets copied, then another little bit gets copied, etc. We'll talk about that in considerably more detail when we get to that particular point. Another aspect that's quite unique about these viruses is that these RNA-dependent RNA polymerases can incorporate a few too many nucleotides every once in a while, and it turns out that that is a very important mechanism for both making poly -A tails, which of course are important for translation, like all other viruses, these depend on cellular translation machinery. Uh, but also for modifying some of the genes in terms of giving you some more diversity. There are few alternative start codons in RDA editing, but these are much less important as far as these viruses are concerned. So our classic sort of outline here, where do these guys come from? And I could usually put origin slash disease because that's how most of these things were discovered in the first place. Um, and these are the mononega virales. And now sometimes these family names are actually really quite useful. Nega, negative strand, mono, single genome. And we'll talk about the segmented genomes later on when we talk about flu. Uh, structure, structure is actually relatively boring. That's probably, probably why people like to talk about paramyxo and rhabdoviruses at the same time. Paramyxoviruses are kind of blobs. Um, rhabdoviruses have this interesting bullet shape. Um, Binding an entry, this is going to kind of begin to start on like a broken record, fusion proteins, conformational changes, et cetera. The replication, of course, is now different than anything we've talked about because these are, of course, negative strand 
viruses that are packaging negative strands inside their virions. Translation, again, has to do with this start and stop. And then getting out of the cell is actually also relatively straightforward. So what are these nega virales? Again, just a single negative strand is what's packaged inside the genome. They bud, they're being produced mostly at the plasma membrane, and also fusion usually takes place at the plasma membrane. The big difference with all of these negative strand RNA viruses is that that genome, when it comes in from the capsid, you've released your genome inside the cell, it's dead. It can't do anything. So all of these viruses have to package an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase in their virions. So the virion just doesn't have your nucleic acid genome in it. It also has an enzyme which is absolutely critical for activity. Yeah? So all RNA viruses encode an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, but these ones actually have to have it in the capsid. Yeah, so just to paraphrase Ian's comment here, all RNA viruses have to have a way of polymerizing their genome. I'm going to slightly paraphrase the answer to the question because we'll talk about retroviruses later on, which have DNA polymerases in them. But uh, they have to have a polymerase encoded in their genome, but if it's positive strand, that can be translated directly. So if it's negative strand, you have to have the protein, which is coded for in the genome, also packaged in the virion. Is that clear? That's sort of the uh, really major distinction with these viruses. There has to be a protein that comes in with them. And that actually also, to some extent, controls how you can have genome entry take place. If you think about genome entry happening like a phage, where you've got this you know, tiny little hole that's going through the membrane, kind of like poliovirus. It's got that tiny little protein in the beginning, but most of these RNA-dependent RNA polymerases are pretty big. And so usually it's going to be some kind of fusion process, how these polymerases actually get in. And then all of these mononegaviruses have start and stop mRNA production. And when we talk about the phyloviruses on Wednesday, we'll <coughs> uh, basically it's the same, same kind of mechanism there. <coughs> But more interesting diseases, so we'll spend more time talking about disease on Wednesday. Yeah? Are they all enveloped? All of the mononegavirales, are they all enveloped? Good question. I don't know of any that are not, but um, my knowledge is not infinite. Right. Generally. <laughs> so generally, certainly all the ones we will talk about are all enveloped, yeah. Which makes sense, again, because that's the way you can release your... Um, you can yeah, release your actual, <coughs> excuse me, uh, RNA polymerase together with your genome. Although if you look at the rhabdoviruses, they're kind of funky in terms of, you know, classic enveloped virus. Yeah? Is it, a, is the polymerase functional in the virion, or is it, is it possible in the cell? So that's, that's a great question. Is the polymerase functional in the virion, or does it actually have to get inside the cell in order to be able to be functional? Again, for these viruses, I'm not absolutely certain. I do know that for the retrovirus, it actually is functional inside the virion. Um, it would not surprise me if they are functional, but I don't absolutely know. Um, usually, the problem is you don't have all the precursors that you would need in order to make all of the rest of your, um, of your genome. So that's, you know, they could be active, but usually they don't have enough to, for instance, be making an extra copy of the genome. Okay, so what do these guys look like? The rhabdoviruses. Um, this image here is also kind of a shout out to Viral Zone. How many of you looked at Viral Zone? How many of you might want to think about looking at Viral Zone before the midterm? <laughs> um, it's a great sort of pictorial overview of all of these different virus families that labels most of the interesting ones in there. There are some issues, but for the most part, it's really pretty good. Um, so, <clears throat> Here are classic rhabdovirus virions. Has an envelope around the outside, glycoprotein sitting in that membrane, a matrix protein which provides the bridge between the glycoprotein and the genome. The genome is encoded, um, again, negative strand RNA. Has a protein that's associated with it, and again, incredibly creatively named the 
N protein because it's associated with a nucleic acid. Uh, but the big difference here, again, sorry to be beating on the dead horse here, but polymerase that's associated with that and also a phosphoprotein, um, phosphoprotein P polymerase, the only one that doesn't have a nice obvious abbreviation to it, the L protein because it's the largest protein in any of these genomes. So that's where those come from. Disease-wise, rabies, hopefully everyone knows about that disease. Um, encephalitis, if it's not treated, one of the really nice things about rabies, nice quote unquote, is that you can treat and vaccinate, uh, so actually after exposure. So um, this is, if you do get bit by the rabid bat, the rabid raccoon, et cetera, um, you can actually have no disease whatsoever if you treat relatively <clears throat> soon thereafter. This was one of the very first vaccines, certainly viral vaccines, to be developed by Louis Pasteur, also through this attenuation process. So taking the virus, infecting, in this case it was rabbits, getting spinal cord in this case from those rabbits, putting it into more rabbits and so on and so forth, and eventually getting an attenuated vaccine that could be used for treating, and again, post-exposure um, in cases. Uh, but since um, it is a rather nasty encephalitis if it's not treated, very few people actually work with the rabies virus itself. Almost everyone works with vesicular stomatitis virus um, for a number of different reasons. Um, one, it's not that pathogenic. In fact, basically no pathogenics whatsoever, at least not in humans. Um, has an extremely broad host range, i.e. it can infect lots of different cells, lots of different cell types, um, and it's been very heavily used for gene therapy. And some of you may have heard about vesicular stomatitis virus in a completely different context, which actually has mostly to do with our next lecture, but RSVSV Zibov, my 11-year-old daughter knew about this, and I didn't even tell her about it, she came up with it, so. Something's rubbing off, or she was working on West Africa at the time. Hmm, I wonder why that is. So um, RZS, RVSV Zibov, so recombinant vesicular stomatitis virus, Zaire Ebola virus, 90 plus percent of this virus is vesicular stomatitis virus, and then just one protein has been put into it from the Ebola virus. And it seems to work actually extremely well. This is the vaccine that was actually furthest along when we had the outbreak in West Africa, just a few years ago now. Um, and that's the only reason it was actually able to be tested, because people had been developing it well beforehand. Uh, they had safety trials, and this is a sort of an outline of how you go through clinical trials. Um, apologize to people who have heard this many, many times before. But a phase one trial is tens of people, and it's all about safety. That was done in October of 2014, actually after the outbreak was already pretty well spreading, which tells you, you know, how long it actually takes to get a lot of these things to happen. And this is all being done in places where there was not Ebola disease, because the only concern of a phase one trial is, is it safe? You know, first in humans kind of process. Phase two is to do more safety trials um, and see if there's any activity whatsoever. And that's in a phase two, that's between hundreds to thousands of people. Um, that was actually done relatively quickly thereafter. Certainly this is like screaming along for most drug trials. Um, and then phase three, which is really you know, showing that it works, um, is thousands to 10,000s of people. And because there was this whole outbreak happening as this was testing, Phase two and phase three were actually combined um, in this particular trial. And this vaccine worked extremely well. Um, the only problem was is that the disease was basically going away kind of by itself because of good public health control uh, mechanisms. But it is a really very good and functional vaccine. And what people did in this particular case, again, since there was an outbreak, what happened is that they had a case, then they would vaccinate everyone around that case. Um, and that would be their, what they call the ring vaccination strategy. Yeah? What's the function of the Ebola protein in phase 
Ah, um, that's to give the immune response. Right. Mm -hmm. What would you think? That would, I think, be a pretty good assumption. <laughs> um, we'll talk more about this, and I'm actually kind of leaving that up in the air right now because there might be a question about it later. Oh. Um, <laughs> and so we'll, um, we'll, we'll talk more about that um, process as we come through. But it's a great thing to start thinking about for the rest of the lecture today. So uh, that's the <laughs> rhabdoviruses. Fortunately, rabies is not too much of a problem because of vaccines, vaccines thank you. Um, and VSV is this really nice system for making lots and lots of potentially other vaccines. Paramyxoviruses, the best known of these is measles. Measles has been around for very long periods of time, certainly most of written history as far as we know. Um, there's a really good vaccine for it, but nonetheless, there are millions of infections that happen every year. We'll talk a lot more about measles and measles vaccines in the next couple of slides. There are a couple of other, excuse me, paramyxoviruses. Um, Rinderpest is a closely related virus, um, which, how many of you speak German? Or know any German? Rind is cow, so it's basically also was you know, known as the, you know, pest or the pestilence of cows, that's also been completely eliminated because of vaccination. Um, used to be a huge problem, particularly in the developing world. So it's sort of the, the second one of the nasty viruses that we've actually finally been able to get rid of after smallpox. Uh, mumps is another one of these. And then a number of what are called emerging diseases, Nipah and Hendra viruses. These are mostly in the tropics uh, and also probably mostly reservoir in, in bat species. And then sort of the VSV equivalent for these is, is Sendai virus because it doesn't cause much in the way of disease. If you look at the virion, again, this is from viral zone, has a hemagglutinin protein, a fusion protein, matrix protein, this N protein that's bound to the genome, as well as a polymerase and a phosphoprotein L and P. So we'll talk again much more about the molecular aspects of these things after I toot my horn about vaccines. So measles. Um, part of the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. Um, if you happen to come down with measles, and particularly this is true for small children, between one in 500 and one in 1,000 kids will come down with measles and die. So one in 500, one to 1,000. Just thinking about some of the risks there. Uh, the main reason that kids die is pneumonia from measles infection. The scariest is probably encephalitis, which happens. And probably the best known example of this is Roald Dahl. You know, Roald Dahl, James and the Giant Peach, et cetera. How many of you know that his daughter died of measles from encephalitis? Apparently was playing with her. She was getting a little slow, feeling really sleepy. An hour later, she was dead, unvaccinated. So <clears throat> this is uh, really scary. And um, even if people don't die from this encephalitis, um, all kinds of intellectual issues. Now, a lot of people argue too many people, in my opinion, argue that vaccines are not safe. Vaccines are not 100.00000% safe. There are a few cases of negative side effects, <coughs> mostly having to do with allergies, rashes, etc. cetera. Uh, there's really good statistics. About four in a million kids have serious side effects. That's 0.0004%. Um, so, side effects, 2,000 times less likely than dying. Take your pick. Um, my kids have all been vaccinated from absolutely as soon as they could be. Um, before vaccination, there were about 4 million cases in the USA per year. Um, since then, it's gone way down. I'll show you the graph on the next page. Um, and measles has been, quote unquote, eliminated 
in the U.S. De decided that you know, 17 years ago now. Um, but that's the actual cases which are circulating here. So these are the cases. This is what happened before the vaccine. The vaccine was licensed in the mid-1960s. Um, this is thousands of cases in the U.S., so you know, bouncing around 500,000. Now, as you remember, one in a thousand of these kids die. So that's you know, hundreds of kids dying every year. Vaccine crashes down to, now we need to change the scale here, um, hundreds. Um, and then there were a few of these blips that happened, you know, getting up to thousands a year. And you know, again, statistically, 20 or 30 kids dying from the disease but now really completely flattened out. So back in the, uh, when America was great, um, we had these things, and uh, now we have this. Yes? Is there a reservoir somewhere that, that is helping the, the uh, anti-vax community keep measles alive now? Uh, I, I'm not gonna mince words. <laughs> <laughs> no, so um, the, the reservoir for measles, so reservoir species, um, one of the good, bad things about measles, again, this is, you know, I want to put the value judgment out here, is that measles only replicates in humans. And so there's no zoonotic reservoir for the disease. So reservoir of measles is going to have to be, if there's none in the U.S., it's coming from other places. So outbreak, outbreak in Minnesota, um, where did that come from? Anybody, everyone heard about the outbreak in Minnesota? Yes, um, unfortunately among Somali uh, Americans for the most part. Um, probably came from Somalia with family or someone visiting family, something like that. Uh, that has not been as well identified to my knowledge as what happened in Disneyland, which is much better and we'll talk about that in, in just a second. Um, but just to give everybody a chance to get 100% on a clicker question, let's do this one. And hopefully this will now work. Yay, it does. Okay. How much more likely is it to die from measles than have a negative reaction to the vaccine? Two times, 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times, 2,000 times. Sorry, I'm very opinionated. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, as you may have noticed. Ten. <coughs> I'm sure you were messing with me not to get 100% here. Yes, it is 2,000 times more likely to die from measles than have a negative reaction to the vaccine. So. Here's our select answer. Come on. I had to change remotes today, so that's the confusing bit here. So um, again, I will keep beating on this dead horse. Don't mind. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question about sure. the vaccine itself. Yeah. How does it confer immunity to measles, mumps, dengue, rubella, and the three attenuated viruses? OK, yeah. So the question is, for MMR, um, what's basically what's in the vaccine? Um, it is three different antigens. I think all three of them are live attenuated. I'm not sure about rubella. That might actually just be different mixtures of antigens. 
So, um, but yeah, it's, it is three completely different things that are just in the one shot and formulated together. It's actually now more common, and those of you with younger kids, um, it's a tetravalent now. So there's actually four things that are in there rather than just the three. Yeah. Oh, for safety purposes? That's, again, a really good question, and I'm probably not the right <laughs> person to answer that. Um, I think it really depends on the actual drug, the treatment which is happening, the dose which is being used, um, those kinds of things. But the fact that in, in the case of the, this RVSV Zbov, um, that was very quick that they went from phase one to phase two because there was this outbreak going on. I don't know about the publications on those. Um, the publications on the phase two and three have actually just been coming out. The last one was in December of last year. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry if we covered this before and I forgot, but in terms of attenuated versus inert vaccines, um, is there ever a case where the inert form just doesn't produce the desired amount of immunity or the optimal amount of immunity and so we have to use attenuated or is it always a, a case of we're only able to get a functional vaccine with inert or with attenuated, so that's what we need. Okay, so the the, the question here for those those you didn't um, hear Ian's question is, you know, basically why attenuated versus inactivated, et cetera? Um, and the answer is it seems to vary from vaccine to vaccine. Um, and in some cases, attenuated seems to work better. In other cases, inactivated seems to work better. Um, certainly in the case of an attenuated vaccine, there's always the potential reversion issue like with polio and the oral polio vaccine. Um, so if you can have an inactivated that works and can be delivered, <coughs> there are lots of logistical issues as well that go with it. Um, if you have an attenuated that's never going to revert, is never going to cause disease, that's probably better. If it still causes enough of an immune response, you're kind of you're balancing the whole thing here. So it's a it's a great question, and people are working on that, in fact, to try and figure out what's going on there. Yeah. Have there been cases of MMR reverting? Um, cases of MMR reverting. Well, so remember, this is the three really three different vaccines there. Um, as far as I know, at least for measles, there's been no examples of reversion that have taken place there. Uh, the measles vaccine, remember the dates here, was actually also developed considerably after the polio vaccine, even the oral polio vaccine. And the process that it went through um, probably allowed more mutations to accumulate. I know that it's known what those number of mutations are. I don't have to know off the top of my head. Okay, so question here about reservoir. What is the reservoir for measles? Well, the main reservoir for measles is not in the U.S. Uh, there are still about half a million deaths worldwide now, um, and there were in 2000. That's gone down considerably, but still there are quite a few measles-related deaths that are happening in the world, and that means that it's circulating. And so the reservoir is actually really the rest of the, the world. According to the Global Vaccine, uh, what's this program? I forget what the A is for again, Action Program. Global Vaccine Action Program. Um, they're gonna try and eliminate measles in five regions. Don't ask me what regions those were. I wasn't able to find out before the lecture today. Um, but the reasoning behind that is there's still, again, quite a lot of measles-related um, cases um, in the world, this is literally from the end of last year to the beginning of this year. Uh, unfortunately, again, mostly in the developing world, but quite a few cases also in the developed world and places where um, it's not being reported. Uh, there are also quite a few places where there's practically no measles-related disease. And this, uh, I didn't do the correlation here, but vaccination rates um, are also much higher in these places. There are some scary places, again, that shouldn't have any measles in them, like this country, that country, this country here, that country here, this country here, um, which will remain nameless. And in fact, even <laughs> scarier are some of these dark red ones right in the middle of Europe. So, um, and most of that is because of 
our friends the anti-vaxxers. So um, here, just cases of whooping cough um, and cases of measles, 2008 to 2014. Um, anti-vax movement, well, this is the most latest anti-vax movement. Actually, there have been anti-vax movements since Jenner, the very first vaccines ever. Um, but this was the um, publication of some links between MMR and autism that have been completely, totally, utterly rebunked, rebutted, um, recused, removed, you know, any other, you know, negative name for that. Pardon? Uh, he still has, makes claims that that's happening. Um, and there's a, well... The journal has retracted it, yes. And he lost his medical license. And now he lives in Texas. And now he lives in Texas. <laughs> and his name will remain not said in this class. Um, but, uh, yeah, to a great extent because of this, and there was, in fact, a nice article, I think it was originally in the Washington Post, about the outbreak in Minnesota, um, having to do with visits of this certain person who now lives in Texas. Um, to that particular community and uh, vaccine rates going way, way down and surprise, surprise, measles rates going up. Go oh, figure. <laughs> and a lightsaber might be useful. Um, <laughs> so um, a bit of a wake up call to this um, happens, I guess what, this is now you know, 2014, 2015, so a couple of years ago now. Um, in, you know, the place you most expect to get measles, um, Disneyland, uh, literally a couple of hundred cases um, of measles from people who had visited Disneyland, um, turned out to be identical to a strain in an outbreak that was happening in the Philippines. Um, almost all cases in the U.S. were non-vaccinated people. There are still a couple of cases. You know, the vaccine is not 100% protective, which is one of the reasons that Everybody needs to get vaccinated. Uh, but the vast majority of people are those who have not been vaccinated. And this is what happens basically in that outbreak from December um, through to April of, of 2015. Majority in California, but of these cases, again, what happens? You know, people go to Disney World and then they come back. And so um, this spread and actually ended up spreading um, all the way across the country after, after April, including up here um, into our state. Um, 147 people. Um, now, this is still below that one in a thousand. So no one actually ended up dying from this. But the more we get, the more likely we are to see some of these. Um, now, this is... What I well, forgot to mention on that last map of the world, Romania is one of the places where they have lots of cases. They've had a couple of deaths now from measles in Romania in the last couple of years. Uh, this is that last outbreak here, that 2014-2015. Again, we're in the, in, the, in the range now that we can start expect to seeing deaths. Now, fortunately, what happened is after 2014, it went way down. And in fact, immunization rates went up and the state of California made exemptions a lot harder. Now again, this is, these are all correlations. We don't know if it's an actual cause and effect, but some of these things actually look pretty good. Yeah. I'm also remembering one of the um, side effects of measles is even if the child seems to recover or person seems to recover um, just fine, it basically wipes out their immune system memory so that they're susceptible to diseases that they were already um, they, they were already immune to in their history or am I remembering a different <coughs> so there are more side effects to measles than what we really account for uh, so are there more side effects I'll just again I'll paraphrase your question here I'm sorry um, are there more side effects to measles than just the ones that I yeah, put up here sort of the classic diseases the pneumonia and the encephalitis? Um, the answer is I think yes, but I'm, again, not an expert by any stretch of the imagine on these, on these things. Imagination, I should say. Um, okay, let's get it. Do we try and get another 100%? Try. Do our best today. I always try, Steve. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, most cases of measles in the USA in the last two decades were introduced from outside the USA, when people were not vaccinated. 
killed the people who were infected, caused encephalitis, A and B. So the question is for the circulating virus. Um, I'm sure there are surveillance which is going on. I just don't know what any of those results are. Ten. Couldn't find a way to verbalize it without <laughs> Yes, A and B. Now there's you could argue and we didn't go through all the details, but most of the individual cases were actually ones that were brought in from overseas. Some of these had spread. And those were some of the ones, again, like the outbreak that happened came through Disneyland. Um, and one could probably argue, and if I were to give you a question like this on an exam, go, oh, Al well, Stedman, it could have been this, could have been that, could have interpreted another way. Um, as I've mentioned before, uh, these don't get proofread anywhere near as well as the exam questions do, because they're usually made far too late the night before um, <laughs> when I put these things together. So yes, I was looking for E. for just in case you were wondering. OK, so that's all I want to talk about for vaccines for today. Don't worry. Tomorrow, we'll, I know, Wednesday, we'll talk about them more. On Friday, we'll talk about them even more. Um, we may have some more in the review session on Monday. Oh, that reminds me. Um, there was a typo in one of the um, syllabus. Uh, the midterm is on the 17th, not on the 15th. Yes. The review will be on the 15th, exactly, yes. OK, so um, let's look at, well, what goes on in these things. How they're making us sick is a whole different question that, yeah, again, we're not going to get into here. Um, these are, again, classic enveloped viruses. On the inside of this envelope is a helical nucleocapsid. This should also sound really familiar. Where did we see this before? Coronaviruses last time. Some of these um, virions are filamentous, and so they're kind of stretched out, and that leads us to, again, what we'll be talking about on Wednesday, which are the, the filoviruses, which are sort of the extreme as far as is concerned. Um, this is basically the same thing that we looked at from the viral zone before. This is the one from our textbook. On the outside of paramyxoviruses, you have a hemagglutinin protein. Not surprisingly, this is what's interacting with the receptor for all of these paramyxoviruses. There's a separate fusion protein that, and again, not surprisingly, is important for fusing these things together. On the inside, you have your nucleocapsid, which is the end protein that's found. There should all be one molecule here. I'm not quite sure why it shows four. Um, and the L protein, which is the polymerase, and the P protein, which is the phosphoprotein. And as is true with the vast majority of these enveloped viruses, there's a matrix protein, which really provides a link between your envelope proteins and your nucleocapsid proteins on the inside. Let's look at these fusion proteins in a little bit more detail. As I mentioned before, fusion happens at the plasma membrane. So right as the virion associates with the cell, that's where fusion takes place. In the case of these paramyxoviruses, it's a <coughs> fusion protein, which is also made through proteolysis, has this very hydrophobic region right here, which is blocked until you have interaction with the receptor by the hemagglutinin protein. Conformational change allows this fusion peptide to now stick into the membrane of the host and 
hold these two together. Big difference between the paramyxoviruses and the rhabdoviruses, particularly VSV. VSV has this G protein or glycoprotein, which is sitting on the outside. It's a combination of these two things. So again, not unlike the coronavirus <laughs> spike protein, we have the receptor binding protein and the fusion protein all together, and we'll see the same thing is true for flu as well. So this glycoprotein, again, G protein, it's the receptor interacting, and also fusion protein, it's absolutely critical for getting endocytosis to take place, again, getting picked up, being brought inside the cell, and it turns out that you can switch out this glycoprotein with pretty much any other one of these class one receptor binding protein fusion proteins and get the VSV that has this other protein on it to go to whatever kind of cell you like. And this is why VSV is such a good way of getting different kinds of viruses into different kinds of cells. You just have to put the appropriate protein on the outside and VSV will go to any of those places. Um, and that to some extent is also why it's really useful for this Ebola virus production. I'm having to do more with cell culture than anything else. Yeah. Okay, so may I, okay, let's, let's back up here a little bit. So this is the example here from paramyxoviruses. There's a receptor binding protein and a fusion protein, separate proteins. VSV, which is a rhabdovirus, and all the rhabdoviruses, these two proteins are combined. Right, and then the second thing is that with VSV, you can exchange that glycoprotein for lots of other proteins and then get VSV to infect lots of other different cells. So the Ebola virus, many people use VSV for pseudo, what they call pseudotyping. So the pseudotype is you put the glycoprotein from your favorite virus onto VSV, and that VSV has some way of detecting where that VSV is gone, now you can get that VSV to go to a cell that it otherwise wouldn't have gone to. And so that's the whole idea of pseudotyping. And anytime you look at virology literature or listen to TWIV, we got another TWIV bump this week, woohoo. Uh, that they talk a lot about pseudotyping, and that's what it really is, is switching out these membrane glycoproteins. And VSV is one of the classic ones that's used for that. Okay, the other important protein in the virion, also present at very high number, or very high amounts, is the nucleocapsid protein. These nucleocapsid proteins bind to the negative strand RNA in a really interesting fashion. It turns out that there's always six nucleotides that are bound per protein subunit, and these all line up on top of each other with a nice um, helical symmetry in terms of packaging the genome. Oh, we're getting ahead of ourselves here. We can't do that. Um, <clears throat> so each of these individual N proteins will package the, <clears throat> excuse me, the negative strand of the genome, but because of that, you're always going to have these sequences that are lined up with each other, and this binding of the protein means that it can't get translated. It's a very tight binding, which is happening in this case. So if your genome is packaged, then it can't be used for translation purposes. Um, and we'll look at this, and this should give you an idea on how the switch gets made between making genome and making protein, which again, we talked about way back when, when we talked about um, MS2 at the very, very beginning um, of the course. So now you've all seen that there's another clicker question coming up. 
So um, we'll ask this one. And well, get me 100%, please. That's what I want. Um, so which of the following rhabdovirus proteins is most likely to be exchanged to make an Ebola vaccine? So this is you know, what the question that Ellis was asking that I refused to answer. <laughs> NCVL or G? As you say, these things are made late at night, so. When I fill in my skin front, it's in the shape of a virus. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> that would be really cool if I could do that. Go back and change all my hair. Just be like, wait a minute, that's like a nuclear cabinet. The helical, the helical, the helical, yeah. uh, heli that would be cool. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Ten. Five. Any more votes? Did I stop it now? Yay. Hallelujah. Thank you. Yes, it is the G protein, uh, the glycoprotein. So um, it's a glycoprotein from Ebola, which got exchanged and is actually also called the G protein um, in <clears throat> rhabdoviruses in VSV. Quick review, however, the N protein is what? The nucleocapsid protein, the C protein, we haven't talked about that. <laughs> um, v protein, we haven't talked about that one either. Um, L protein is the large protein, which is also the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, exactly. OK, um, this actually really should be um, not fusion, but receptors. Should need to change this one. So uh, where do they bind? Um, Sendai virus binds to sialic acid. So this is a sugar on the outside. Measles, on the other hand, um, binds to immune cell receptors, which may get to your question about if you have uh, measles, does it kill off a bunch of immune cells and have problems with it? Uh, the hemagglutinin or hemagglutinin neuraminidase turns out the different paramyxoviruses actually have some have the neuraminidase, some don't. This is called the receptor binding protein. Um, and then, of course, F changes on receptor binding. And lo and behold, when you look at these structures, they're trimers as well. So class one, really typical kinds of fusion proteins. So once you've had receptor binding and fusion take place, again, almost always at the plasma membrane, what do you get? So this is the genome. This is the Sendai virus genome. The measles virus genome is extremely similar to this. So remember, again, it's a negative strand. So the three prime end is the beginning of your genome, and the five prime end is the end of your genome. This is just to show that the G protein, again, from these rhabdoviruses is basically a combination of these two proteins. Um, N is at the three prime end of the genome. L is at the five prime end of the genome. So if you want to think about these proteins from the structural, non-structural point of view, this is your non-structural protein. And these guys are all of your structural proteins, which could kind of already give you a bit of an idea that you're going to have a lot more of these proteins and less of these proteins. The question is, how does that happen? How do you get a lot more messenger RNA, particularly for the N protein, than you do for the L protein? One other thing that I wanted to mention here, and that is if you look at these gray areas, so the intergenic regions, i.e. between the coding sequences, they have a whole stretch of U's, but not an infinite number of U's. And then this uh, GAA um, position here right in between. Turns out all of these are identical. Each of the sequences in these gray zones are absolutely identical to each other. And that gives us a bit of an idea on how the messenger RNAs are actually being made. So what happens is that you have your 
L protein, the RNA dependent RNA polymerase, which is present always together with the phosphorylated protein. This binds to the three prime end of your genome and starts to make an RNA. Once it gets to this gray box region <coughs> right here, the polymerase sees this stretch of U's. And instead of just making a few of those and stopping, it makes a whole bunch of copies of these U's. And why is that important? Well, because you need poly A tails for your messenger RNAs. So it makes a whole bunch of U's. And then in some cases, the polymerase just falls off and goes back here and starts again goes back here and starts again. In a few cases, however, it stays on and will start to make more of this next gene. And in some cases, it gets to the end here. Now it will stutter, put on a few A's. In some cases, keep going, but in most cases, fall off. And so in that way, you end up with way more of the N protein than, or say the N mRNA, than any of these other RNAs, and the L1 is the one that you have in the very smallest amount. Now, there was, and they talk about this a little bit in the textbook, a couple of models on how this could have potentially worked, and that is whether the polymerase actually will bind to each of these positions um, coming in from solution. So your polymerase could bind here, transcribe here, and then start again here, start again here, start again here. And there were some really nice experiments that they discuss at length in TWIV 427, um, whereby they made a mutation right here in this gene. And what they found is when you make a mutation in this gene, you don't get any of the other genes. And so this mutation causes the polymerase to stop, causes polymerase to stop, then you never get any of these genes down here. And so what that tells you is that it, the polymerase just binds at one end and goes all the way down. It doesn't rebind and restart at all of these different conditions. And again, this is nicely described in that TWIF. Yeah? Um, and this is for paramexo and rhabdo? Mm -hmm. Yeah, paramexo and rhabdo, and as we'll see for the phyloviruses as well. Um, very, very similar. Yeah, the genomes here are, are extremely similar, and the, and the only big difference between them is that G protein, which is the fusion between those two, and then the shape of the actual virion. So <clears throat> the next question that I'm sure all of you have been asking is, well, okay, how do you go from this starting and stopping and making a whole bunch of extra A's and U's to making a whole copy of the genome without making all those stutterings and starting and stoppings and falling off, because you need the full length, actually positive strand of your genome that you then need to make into the negative strand, which is what gets packaged, et cetera. So it turns out that all of this is dependent on the concentration of the N protein. If you have low concentration of the N protein, you haven't bounded up into that nice helix every six nucleotides. It's available, and the polymerase, which is the, the replicase, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, will, when it gets to one of these intergenic sequences, stutter and occasionally fall off. On the other hand, when you have high concentrations of N, you'll bind the whole genome, and that then gets the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase to not stutter and just go all the way down to the opposite end of the genome. You may also have been wondering where the heck does the cap come from? Because we have the stuttering, which gives you the tail. The cap, it turns out, is also made by the L protein. So it's not only an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, but also has capping activity. Um, and so this is, again, it's all about the N protein. Yeah. Transcribe while these proteins, while the N protein is bound to the region it's transcribing? So when it's making, actually, so why don't we just go here to the next uh, figure? <laughs> so um, when it's making genome, 
the RNA dependent mRNA polymerase is reading off that sequence in the presence of the end protein. Now, if you think with the end protein, it's bound to the RNA, bound to the RNA to block translation from taking place, but it's not blocking replication from taking place. Um, and that's the real um, key here is so your, here's your genomic RNA. That genomic RNA, oh, pardon me, the genomic RNA will get <clears throat> transcribed, or the messenger RNAs will be made by the LP protein until you have more and more of this N protein, which will bind up your genome and then lead to both first positive strand and then negative strand production. So it's, again, it's all, if you don't have too much of this N protein around, you're going to make these individual ones. Eventually, you'll get to the far end of the genome. You'll end up with lots of N protein. That will start to bind to all of these genomes, which will lead to the production of antigenome and eventually full-length genome. Um, so antigenome is now just your positive strand of the RNA, which is there. So one other quick thing that I wanted to cover here, you may remember one of those genes was P, C, and V. What the heck is that all about? So P is what? The phosphoprotein that's associated with the polymerase. And it turns out you actually really do need that um, protein. There are other proteins that are made, C and V, that are probably important for virus stability, but you know, not as critical. Uh, these proteins are made from one gene, one sort of separate thing between each of these energenic segments, um, present in all of these paramyxovirus genomes. There are a couple of different ways that they're made. The main one, the P protein, is the normal open reading frame, no question about it, it's the one we actually have much more of. However, there are some places in this gene where you have a whole run of nucleotides that are exactly the same. And this RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, what does it do when it gets to use? It stutters and makes a whole bunch of copies of them. In this case, for the V protein, it stutters and adds an extra G, which will change the reading frame of the messenger RNA that was made and give you the V protein. And there's also a W protein, which actually doesn't seem to be critical here. Um, and that's what happens if you end up with two nucleotides and have changed the frame yet again. So here we have three different frames. The V protein does seem to be useful to the virus. The W protein does not where you're using multiple different open reading frames, which should also sound really familiar because we talked about that way back when with what virus? FIX-174. <laughs> so the neurons firing here. So um, there's also the C protein. Remember, this is the PCV gene here. The C protein is actually coded for by a different start codon. So normally our start codons are here. If you started at one AUG, you'll continue GAU, CAA, GAU, GCC, et cetera. But in a few cases, and this is you know, relatively small numbers, this messenger RNA gets made from this AUG, and you end up with, again, a different protein using a different open reading frame. So, all the same nucleotides, three different reading frames, three different proteins. Although three different proteins, the V protein only has a small part that's, that's different than the P protein. Because otherwise, the gray here is all identical sequence. It's the orange, which is different sequence. But the reason that this is happening, at least for the P and V, is the same reason that you're getting poly-A tails. It's this stuttering. It's the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase when it gets to a whole run of nucleotides occasionally putting in one too many. 
Um, and that, again, does seem to be important and presumably conserved for these various different viruses. Um, this we talked about already, so genome production. Last thing to talk about is packaging. This is not terribly unusual. We've kind of talked about this before. Um, buds at the plasma membrane, how does that happen? You have N protein that associates with the negative strand of your genome, and then the M protein, which is a matrix protein, that then will associate with your glycoprotein, be it the G protein, if we're talking the rhabdoviruses, or the fusion protein, and HN in the paramyxoviruses. It will then bud off of this membrane, give you an infectious virion, which would go off and infect another cell, et cetera. One thing that can sometimes happen with these proteins is what's called syncytia formation. Anyone know what a syncytium is? Yes, no, some of you. Um, it's cells that have fused together. So if you just express either the F protein from paramyxovirus or the G protein from these rhabdoviruses, they will cause cells to fuse with each other. And again, it's not terribly surprising because, you know, as this is sort of budding off here, if there happens to be another cell which is right next to it, these things can fuse with each other. And it turns out that this is, A, a way that you can see viral disease happening, um, but also if for some reason experimentally you want to cause cells to fuse, you can just include some of these fusion proteins and they will fuse membranes for you. And it turns out that this is very similar to the proteins that are involved in making the syncytia, which is important for placental development. So the very similar proteins here, also called syncytions, um, seem to be really involved in forming um, the placenta, which is one of the reasons why viruses are critical for motherhood. But we can talk more about that later. So um, no chance to talk about MERS. I keep adding those slides at the end, but it's not going to happen, I don't think. So I won't include them next time. Uh, we'll talk nasty filovirus disease on Wednesday.